Welcome everyone to the Linnaean Society of London, the Linnaean Society of London globally. So tonight's lecture is Dr. Wolfgang Wooster, who's a reader in zoology, molecular ecology at Bangor University. His research interests span a wide range of topics in evolution, systematics and ecology using snakes as a model system. His current and recent things he looked at is, in, is the evolution of venom composition and, the, and its drivers and selection, the origin of venom systems, species delimitation in snake species complexes and the evolution of warning signals and mimicry systems, biogeography, phylogeography and ecology. So that's basically everything to do that you ever wanted to know and more about snakes. But snakes are fascinating because snake bites, I didn't know this, snake bites cause approximately 100,000 human fatalities every year worldwide. And we often think of venom as part of their interface with other, with other origin, with other um, organisms, things like in their in diet or in defense. And the role of adaptation in diet has been, has been studied, but, it, but that of its selection for defense has been largely neglected. So Wolfgang tonight will highlight the need for better natural history and functional data on how snakes use their venom to better understand the evolution of the system of venom for defense. Over to you, Wolfgang. Really interested to see what you're gonna say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So, yes, yeah, so my interest, well, really, I've always been interested in snakes and where it comes to the venom side, I guess what it really boils down to. I'm interested in understanding what snakes do with their venoms and what drives the evolution of those systems. So tonight I'm just going to talk a bit about the function of venom and snakes and the adaptations that underlie that. So, first of all, I think Many people have these ideas of snakes being somehow supernatural animals with all sorts of weird powers and things like that. In reality, it's just worth remembering snakes are just fairly ordinary animals made out of flesh and bone. They need all the things that other animals do, like food, water, shelter, they need to reproduce. And they are predators, they therefore interact with other species, both as predator and as prey. And in those snakes that are venomous, that venom is simply part of that interface between the snake and its environment. Because venom is part of the interface with the environment, it's exposed to the usual natural selection pressures, uh, just as any phenotypic uh, trait in any, any other animal. So the sort of take home message from all this is that if we want to understand what's going on in the evolution of snake venom, we really need to understand the biology of the snakes and what they actually do with their venoms. So back to basics, what is snake venom? That's an ashes spitting cobra and all that venom came from that one snake. That's a phenomenal venom yield that would wreck anyone's weekend. Uh, the key thing here is that snake venoms aren't simple substances, they are complex cocktails that consist of dozens or even a couple of hundred uh, proteinaceous bioactive uh, toxins, individual toxins belonging to a smaller number of gene families. And that complexity begets potential for variation in venom composition, and that turns out to be a pretty ubiquitous phenomenon in snakes, and it's found at all levels. So you, in many species, you have individual variation in venom composition with ontogeny. You could have two individuals of the same population with quite different venoms. It happens between populations, and then, of course, between species and above. And one of the reasons that we're very interested in variation in venom composition is because of its biomedical uh, implications. Uh, we've just been given a summary, something like 100,000 snake bite deaths a year, and on top of that, probably several hundred thousand more permanent disabilities. And this variation in composition is the absolute bane of anyone trying to look for treatments for snake bite. So, the poster child for medically significant uh, snake venom composition differences are the saw scaled vipers, genus Echis. Uh, and if you're a West African farmer and you get bitten by the West African uh, Echis ocellatus, the local Echis species, and you get treated with an antivenom that's specifically raised against the venom of Echis ocellatus, then your chances of dying from that are something of the order of two, maybe 3%, which are basically those cases that come to hospital too late and are beyond recovery by the time they get treated. 
If on the other hand, you get treated with Echis carinatus antivenom imported from Asia, which has happened at various points in West Africa, then your fatality rate is more of the order of 15%, which is approximately the same as if you did nothing at all. The antivenom simply doesn't touch it. So we have major differences in venom composition, which simply mean that an antivenom for one completely fails to treat uh, the bite by another, even these closely related species, which were once regarded as conspecific. So clearly, uh, Thinking of that in terms of the medical importance, it's, it would be nice to know why this is happening. Why do we see these differences in venom composition? And to answer that, we need to think, okay, what natural selective pressures might act on venom evolution? And that means answering the question, what snakes actually do with their venom? And the three main functions that have been proposed for that are diet, that is to say overpowering prey, possibly digestion of prey, and then self-defense. So I'll talk about diet first. Snakes are predators, they eat other animals, and they use venom to overpower those animals. Venom is a very effective way of rapidly overpowering potentially well-defended prey, like this gaboon viper eating a cat somewhere in uh, Africa. Clearly, there's selection pressure there for the snake to be able to rapidly and effectively overpower its prey before it gets injured itself. So if diet is the major driver here, then we would predict that venom composition in snakes should be optimized to whatever they're eating in any one place. And we might, for instance, predict higher lethality to diet taxa than to others. And one study that we did some years ago now was, again, with Echis, with sore-scale vipers. Sore-scale vipers have the great advantage uh, that they eat a lot of arthropods, like scorpions and centipedes, and under home office rules, those things aren't real animals, so we're less restricted in what we can do in terms of animal ethics. And it also turns out that in Echis, there's very pronounced differences in diet between the major species groups. So Echis carinatus from uh, Western Asia and Echis pyramidum from Northern Africa have diets that are very arthropod rich, something like two thirds of the diet consists of arthropods. Echis ocelatus from West Africa, top right, uh, has a diet that's just about a majority of vertebrates. And Echis coloratus, bottom right, is pretty much a vertebrate specialist and very rarely eats uh, arthropods. So we've got very different diets here and diet items that are physiologically very different. You'd expect to need different venoms perhaps to overpower an arthropod than to disrupt homeostasis in a vertebrate. And it turns out that in source-scale vipers, there's quite extreme uh, diet-specific uh, venom lethality differences. The two arthropod eating species on the left, Echis pyramidum and Echis carinatus, so the y-axis shows how much basically shows how much venom it's, it is needed to kill a scorpion. And you can see that you need very little venom from Echis pyramidum and Echis carinatus. You need rather more from Echis ocellatus with the in-between diet. And the venom of Echis coloratus, the vertebrate feeder, is something like 15 times less lethal to scorpions than that of the more specialized arthropod feeders. So tremendous adaptation to diet in these venoms. If we map that onto a phylogeny, most vipers are vertebrate feeders and don't have scorpion lethal venom. The puff adders are outgroup here. And it seems that both an arthropod rich diet and arthropod lethal venom evolved at the base of the Echis radiation was retained in most of these species. And then Echis coloratus went back to a vertebrate dominated diet and lost both the arthropod component of its diet and the arthropod lethal venom. So we've got a nice example of two instances of co-evolution of diet and specific venom lethality, which I think is a nice demonstration of the adaptive nature of venom in relation to diet. <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, there are large numbers of examples, vipers, elapids, colubrids, and so on, of snakes where there's evidence of adaptation of venom for diet. And it's kind of become the accepted paradigm of snake venom evolution, that it's all driven by natural selection for diet. 
And that paradigm is kind of enhanced by the fact that you don't just get adaptation of venom in the snakes, it's a two way thing. Uh, the prey responds to selection from snakes. So snakes exert selection pressure on prey with their venom, the prey under selection to escape that venom somehow or other, and they do so by evolving resistance to many snake venoms, which has now been demonstrated in a number of taxa, both of snake prey and also snake predators. So you've now got this arms race where snakes under selection to circumvent prey resistance and prey under selection to avoid snake venom. And that can have quite spectacular consequences. This is one such example. Uh, this pits the sea crate, a genus of marine elapid snakes, uh, Laticauda, against moor eels, Gymnothorax, and related genera. So sea crates are widespread in the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans and are prey specialists that feed primarily on moor eels. And it turns out that moor eels in the Indian and Pacific Oceans are phenomenally resistant to Laticauda venoms compared to other eels. So this is from a paper from 1995, and you can see that non-prey yields die after 0.1 milligrams per kilo. Basically, you wave an epi of venom at the aquarium and these things go belly up. On the other hand, moray eels, which are subject to predation by Laticauda, will survive something like 45 to 75 milligrams per kilo, which is the entire venom yield of an adult Laticauda, and would be plenty to kill any of us. And that has real life consequences, as I will show in this video. So let's have to go through the first bit. This is from a bunch of scuba divers. So let's skip that bit. This is a very ambitious Laticauda trying to eat a moray eel. Uh, it's obviously been chewing away at the moray's real, uh, rear end for a while, and the moray is really looking pretty unhealthy there. You wouldn't sell that life insurance. Or would you? Suddenly it seems to be rallying a bit. And here you go, suddenly the moray is sort of rallying and is starting to bite the, the uh, Laticauda. Morays have big teeth and strong bites, so that's going to hurt the snake. That's not good. If you just forward a little bit further along, the moray is now looking pretty lively and has had enough of all this. You can see quite fast responses by the moray there, biting away at the sea crate. That's going to hurt. And the sea crates let go. The moray swims away. And the sea crate has lost its prey. It's uh, wasted its venom. Uh, and it's taken several bites. That must have been quite painful and uh, quite uh, you know, a significant injury potentially from the moray eel. That's what natural selection for prey selectivity in venom actually looks like. So resistance matters. So in terms of the use of venom for uh, foraging, venom is essential for foraging in many snakes. So there's selection for prey-specific venom, lots of examples of prey-specific venom activity, as I've shown. And there are now a number of well-documented examples of prey resistance against venoms. And you then get these predator-prey arms races, phenotype matching, and so on scenarios where uh, basically uh, prey and snakes play a kind of chemical cat and mouse game. But basically the idea that venom variation is primarily driven by natural selection related to foraging is the current paradigm. So what else might come into it? Digestion, that's been suggested. Um, snakes have an unusual foraging biology in that they eat relatively large prey and because they can't take it to pieces, they swallow it in one piece. So they now have the challenge of digesting a great big lump of prey sitting in their stomach using the stomach juices from the outside uh, while potentially there's decomposition happening from the inside. So digesting a large prey item could be a challenge. And because of that, it's been suggested that venom plays a role in digestion. You're effectively starting digestion from the inside as well as the outside to speed up that process. Uh, the evidence for that idea is relatively weak. There's limited and conflicting experimental evidence in some vipers, but there are also plenty of snakes that have venoms that basically don't digest anything, including most uh, elapid snakes. 
And the other thing is that digestion is a fairly generic process, okay? It might differ a bit depending on whether you're eating arthropods or frogs or mammals, but not really at the kind of fine-grained level at which we're seeing medically important differences uh, in venom composition in many snake genera. So that seems a very unlikely explanation for the complex uh, and extreme variation in venom composition that we see in many snakes. And the third one is defense. Now, snakes are somewhere in an ecological web. They interact with other species as predators because they eat other animals, and they also prey for a wide variety of other predators, including birds and mammals and things like that. And clearly that also imposes selection pressures. So what about the use of venom in defense? Now we know they do it due to human snake bite. Uh, gory slide coming up, if you don't like it, look away. Uh, people get bitten by snakes when snakes defend themselves. It's obviously devastatingly expensive as uh, uh, effective, sorry, as we know from uh, the many cases of snake bite death worldwide every year. What we really have no idea about, or didn't have until very, very recently, was any idea of whether venom composition itself and the venom apparatus were subject to selection for defense, or whether it was just all a product of selection for diet, with no, uh, with defense just being a sort of secondary use that venom can be put to. <clears throat> and a lot of the difficulty is just about how can we go about testing uh, whether a substance has a defensive function. One thing we can do is we can look at other organisms where venom very clearly is there for defensive function. So if we think, for instance, of a bee, I'm sure many of you will have been stung by a bee. Bee venom is purely uh, defensive. You don't need venom to overpower pollen or something like that. Uh, and as we all know, when you get stung by a bee, it hurts straight away. You don't get stung by a bee and an hour later you, say, you think, hey, this is starting to smart a bit. It hurts straight away. That's what the bee needs. It wants you to go away from its hive straight away before you do damage. And the same applies for other defensive venoms. You expect instant pain because that gives that venomous organism a chance to survive uh, before it's injured beyond recovery by the predator. And here's how, what that can look like in a more extreme case than bees. So let's fast forward that again. Here's a predator. The predator's foraging. He found a lobster. Yummy, yummy. And he needs venom, not from the lobster, but from one of the lionfish there. He's extremely distracted. He's dropped his lobster. He's dropped his prey. a spear gun and he very clearly has forgotten all about foraging and is just in intense pain and just wants to get out of there. And this goes on for the full, full length of the video through several decompression stops all the way to the surface. This person was in extremely severe pain. That's what a defensive venom does. Do we see this in snakes? Is there evidence of this defensive, fun defensive function in snakes? Um, not necessarily. There are certainly some snakes which are actually quite notorious for painless bites. This snake is an Indian crate, Bungaris ceruleus. Uh, crates are notorious for crawling into people's houses at night and biting sleeping people, perhaps because they roll on them. And the bites are completely painless. Some people don't even wake up from them. Others wake up, but nothing's happening. So they don't worry about it and uh, don't do anything about it and go back to sleep and then wake up near death uh, in the morning. These things are painless for several hours before anything starts to happen. Clearly, that's not what you would expect from a defensive venom. On the other hand, there's some instances where there seems to be a defensive function. So the Texas coral snake has a toxin, MITTX, that opens acid sensing ion channels, causes intense pain. It's basically the same receptors that burn when you eat a hot chili. And that particular toxin has no other known toxic effect. So maybe here we do have selection for uh, defense. But do we have any kind of widespread pattern? Is there a general pattern in terms of whether defense was important in snake venom evolution? 
So how can we find out about the extent to which venoms cause instant pain? There are laboratory assays available, pitting venoms against uh, neuronal cell preparations, but obviously it's fairly labor intensive, especially if you want to cover a large number of species. So we thought, okay, how about we find a model organism that can be exposed to a wide variety of venoms and that can communicate what happens when, when you are exposed to different snake venoms. And we found the perfect uh, model organism for that. Our colleague, herpetologist, that's a uh, python there, not a, not a venomous snake, you'd be pleased to hear. But there are a large number of people, both scientific herpetologists, field workers, ecologists, and of course, uh, many herpetoculturists, captive keepers who keep venomous snakes and who do get bitten with some regularity. And we thought, okay, well, we want to know about pain after snake bite, why don't we ask them? So we put up an online questionnaire asking about the time frame of pain development after snake bite. And this was done by my honors project student, Harry Ward Smith, who put up this questionnaire online. Uh, we published that early last year, pretty much a year ago now. And basically we thought about what, would our, what, what are our predictions? If we have a venom that evolved uh, primarily with a foraging function, with selection pressure for foraging, then we wouldn't particularly expect rapid pain. It doesn't really matter to a snake whether its prey dies in agony or whether it gently slips away. So we might expect, we, might, we wouldn't necessarily expect early pain, and we might expect severe pain later or not, depending on what exactly the venom does, but there's no particularly well-defined prediction. We could also envisage a lot of variation even within species if there's no particular selection for pain uh, after venom injection. On the other hand, if we're dealing with venoms that evolved under selection for defense, what we would expect is a very rapid increase and a very rapid early severe peak of pain, with pain being a major early effect. And we would expect that to be a fairly constant pattern, uh, certainly within species. Okay, we wouldn't expect that pattern to be particularly variable, just like it isn't after bee stings. Everybody who gets stung by a bee agrees it hurts straight away. So basically what we asked in the questionnaire is the severity of the pain on a 0 to 10 scale within the first minute of the bite, uh, within the first five minutes after the bite, and then the maximum level at any point. Uh, note we're mostly interested in the timeline here. Obviously individual pain thresholds vary, but we should be able to agree whether people had their maximum pain very early on or whether it was something nothing early on and uh, the pain became much worse later. And we also asked about the time to incapacitation from pain, whether it was within the first five minutes, that ecologically relevant time when a snake might escape a predator without too much injury, whether it was after more than five minutes when it probably wouldn't matter all that much in terms of escaping a predator, the snake would be dead by then, or whether it never happened. So the emphasis is very much on the timeline rather than the absolute pain intensity, which is of course highly subjective. Uh, so just uh, the sort of fairly crude raw data, we had over 500 different responses, and I think we had 150 or 200 different species of snake that we had data for. Uh, I don't have the full numbers in my, in my memory right now, but certainly not something you can replicate very easily in the lab. And the pattern across the major families of uh, snakes here were very much that pain in the first minute and the first five minutes was relatively low, and then it got a lot worse later on, particularly in the lapids and vipers, the two main families of uh, venomous snakes. So the pattern is more in keeping with the idea of a foraging venom where pain develops later as a byproduct of other things the venom is doing, rather than as a specific venom activity. Um, we can look at that in individual species. Here are two species that everybody would agree you really don't want to get bitten by, the puff adder on the left and the western diamondback rattlesnake on the right. Both can cause really horrific local tissue damage, obviously immensely painful. You end up, end up with an arm the size of your thigh from the swelling with blisters and all the rest of it. So it's they're, they're horrible bites. But you can see in all of these, pretty much the colored lines are individual bite individual pain trajectories after a bite, the dotted line is the mean. And you can see that in both species, by and large, pain started off fairly mild. It was still fairly mild after five minutes and it became much, much worse later on. 
All of this is consistent with the idea that these venoms evolved under selection more likely for foraging than for defense. We also see a huge amount of variation. This is our, Brit our British adder from home. And again, we can see the individual trajectories and we can see a huge number of different experiences from flat zero all the way through, even though the bites were envenomed, uh, right through to severe pain from early on all the way through and also then very little early pain followed by much more severe pain later on. So you get just about any possible pattern of pain evolution in the adder. Again, huge variation, not what you would predict if there was strong selection for defensive function for, uh, for early pain. This is not what you would get after bee stings. And finally, time to becoming too incapacitated by pain, the moment where you drop your lobster. And you can see that happened in the first five minutes in only about 13 or 14% of bites. Okay, so it was actually very rare that people experienced uh, incapacitating early pain. And perhaps even more surprisingly, more than 50% of cases never actually experienced incapacitating pain. Snakebite is normally thought of as an immensely painful experience, but clearly uh, in a lot of cases that doesn't actually necessarily happen. So overall, the dominant pattern here is very much pain of slow onset as a byproduct of other venom activities. It's rarely rapidly distracting or incapacitating. And I think what we can say based on that is that there's no strong evidence for generalized selection for a defensive function. By and large, as a generalization, most snake venoms don't seem to be under selection for defense. Now, obviously, these are hideously noisy and very low resolution data. It's not so much painting with a broad brush as throwing buckets of paint around. Uh, and clearly they're likely to be exceptions hiding within all that noise. One exception that would seem to be an obvious one that should be explored is that of spitting cobras. So spitting cobras are a unique group of elapid snakes. They have evolved the adaptation of being able to squirt venom from their fangs over a distance of a couple of meters. And uh, quite intriguingly, that evolved three times independently in three closely related cobra and cobra-like lineages in Asia and Africa, which is great because it means we've got replicate experiments. So we can test some of our predictions in a slightly more rigorous way than if it evolved once. And it is a purely defensive adaptation. They always bite their prey, and they're also perfectly capable of biting uh, predators as well. But the first response is usually to spit. Cobras spit uh, in, when, when, if cobra venom gets into your eyes after being spat at, then it's extremely painful. It's painful very rapidly. And it certainly is the kind of thing that would be rapidly distracting or incapacitating uh, to, any, uh, to any predator. The adaptations that we've known about for a long time involve the fangs. So basically the fang morphology is changed so that in a spitting cobra, when venom is pumped through the hollow hypodermic syringe-like fang, it exits in a forward direction, whereas in a non-spitting cobra and any other non-spitting snake, it just exits in a downward uh, direction. And there are, of course, behavioral adaptations of spitting. There's uh, head wobbling in many of them, which ensures that they cover their target. Uh, and so on. So there, there are quite a lot of behavioral adaptations as well. What we haven't known anything about at all until now is whether there's also any adaptations in venom composition. Do spitting cobras have venoms that are more adapted for the purpose of causing pain when squirted into an adversary's eye? A recent paper by Panagidis et al. talked quite a bit about cytotoxicity as a defensive innovation in cobras, but interestingly, they found no association between spitting and higher cytotoxicity. A lot of cobras have high cytotoxicity, some don't. The assumption was that cytotoxicity means pain, but there was no association of spitting and higher cytotoxicity. And interestingly, when we looked at our data from cobras, uh, from, uh, our, from the snake bite pain study, we didn't find that cobras in general, in general were particularly painful. So the, the red line is family lapidae as a whole. Uh, unfortunately, our sampling of spinning cobras was very small. People seem to stay clear of these. And uh, so we can't really say anything about whether spitting cobras inflict more painful bites than uh, others. 
However, some years ago, together with a wide variety of colleagues, uh, we set about exploring that. This is a study that was led by my former PhD student, Nick Caswell, now professor at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and his student, Talene Kazanjin. Uh, and it basically involved an extensive collaboration involving transcriptomic and proteomic analysis of venom composition, multilocus phylogeny, and then functional assays, particularly to what extent different cobra venoms activate sensory neurons. And I'm delighted to say that we published that in Science uh, in uh, January. And basically what was found was that in uh, spitting cobras, spitting cobra venoms are more likely will activate sensory neurons uh, far more than the venoms of non-spitting cobra. So this tree here shows the phylogeny. Uh, the color of it here is the uh, level of cell activation. And the lower the figure, the warmer the colors, the less venom it takes to uh, activate uh, sensory neurons. So the, the, the warmer the colors, the more algesic, the more pain causing the venom. And there was a statistically significant association between uh, spitting and uh, algesic activity in these venoms with the phylogeny regressed out. But there was no difference in cytotoxicity. So it wasn't the cytotoxicity that seems to be responsible for causing this algesic activity in the venoms. So we then looked at the wider venom composition of these different groups. These pie charts indicate the extent to which different groups of toxins, gene families are represented in the proteomes and transcriptomes of various cobras, spitting and non-spitting. Uh, for cytotoxins, there's no real pattern, but the one group of toxins that kind of stands out for being very variable is the phospholipases A2. <coughs> Excuse me. And it, but looking at the diagram here, it seems clearly that uh, the spitting cobras have much higher levels of phospholipase A2 expression than non-spitting cobras. And that's statistically significantly associated with spitting. So could it be that it's these phospholipases A2 that hold the key to the extra pain causing activity of uh, spitting cobra venoms? So to try that out, to, do, to try to understand the basis of the increased pain of spitting cobra venoms, we separated out the different venom fractions. And we then tried the phospholipases A2 of representative spitting cobras on, uh, on the sensory neurons. And it turns out that the PLA2s by themselves don't do anything. They're no more effective than the negative control. If we use the cytotoxins on their own, Yes, they do cause some nociceptor activation, but they don't recapitulate the venom effect. Okay, so the cytotoxins cause some pain, but they don't recapitulate what the whole venom does. And on the other hand, when you reconstitute the phospholipase plus cytotoxin mixture, then you start to see much more severe algesic activity, much more severe nociceptor activation. And it's clearly a synergy between these two toxins that cause, that's causing that. And these three species here are representatives of the three spitting lineages. So we can see that the same synergy between phospholipases and cytotoxins to cause increased nociceptor activation has evolved three times independently in these three spitting cobra lineages. So three independent origins of a complex synergy between two different toxin families uh, are associated with spitting. So that begs the question of why this has happened. What's the selection pressure that might explain uh, this evolution of both the complex behavior that is spitting and the morphological adaptations that go with it and a complex uh, biochemical molecular interaction, a synergy between two toxin types. One way of looking at that is to think, okay, here's a dated phylogeny. When did spitting evolve in cobras? And what else was happening in the world at the time? If we look at the African spitting cobras, they started to diversify somewhere between five and a half and about eight million years ago. Uh, so that spitting must have evolved by then. In the Asian spitting cobras, 
uh, splitting evolved around about two and a half million years, two million to three million years ago. And we can now start asking, okay, what else was happening? Unfortunately, the third spitting linear Chimacartus Chimacartus is monotypic and there's really no constraint on there other than between yesterday afternoon and 17 million years ago. But in these two ca the cases of the African and the Asian spitting cobras, we can start to ask what else was happening in the world at the time. And part of the answer is we were happening. So this is a phylogeny of uh, hominins uh, to the same time scale as the cobra, uh, as the cobra phylogeny above. And what we see when we look at the African spitting cobras, their diversification coincides very nicely with the split between the pan, the chimpanzee and bonobo lineage, and the, the lineage leading to humans. Okay, at the same time, both in Africa. In Asia, the evolution of spitting in the Asian spitting cobras happens to coincide quite nicely with the arrival of the first Asian hominins. The first Homo erectus uh, traces in Asia uh, date back to just over two million years ago. So we've got a remarkable temporal coincidence here between the diversification of the first hominins and their arrival in uh, Asia and the evolution of spitting in cobras. So could there be a causal relationship there? Uh, my colleague Harry Green from Cornell has been arguing this case for a while. He's called it Lucy's legacy after the famous Australopithecus afarensis uh, skeleton. Uh, and well, it seems quite surprising, but we can start to think about that. It does actually make a certain amount of sense. Now primates in general are known to dislike snakes and they often injure and kill snakes without even any predatory intents. A lot of primates will actually go out of their way and injure or kill snakes, even though they don't plan to eat them. And that seems to be the case, particularly for venomous species. Many of them do seem to know the difference. Then primates use tools. So a wide variety of primates have been shown to use sticks and stones and things like that against snakes. And now with the split between the pan and the homo lineages, we've suddenly got these tool using primates that really don't like snakes, that are nasty pieces of work and horrible to snakes. And now they're bipedal and they've got both their hands free for tool use and to get up to all sorts of mischief. So it's certainly highly conceivable that this constitutes increased selection for long distance defense against these bipedal tool using primates that have suddenly walked out of the forest into the savannah or that have arrived in uh, Southeast Asia. So what we have in spitting cobras is this remarkable, remarkable phenomenon that a very specialized, sophisticated defense mechanism evolved three times independently the same molecular mechanism for causing in enhanced pain evolved three times independently. And in two of those, that happened to coincide with the arrival of an organism that's hostile to snakes and is likely to attack snakes uh, and be able to attack and harm snakes from a distance. So there's at least pretty decent circumstantial evidence that suggests that the origin of hominins may well have been uh, behind the evolution of uh, spitting in snakes. It's obviously purely correlation, correlation. It is falsifiable. If we find spitting fangs, spitting cobra fangs that predate the earliest uh, hominins, then that would sink the hypothesis. But it's certainly as good as any other or better than any other hypothesis that has been suggested for this. And I think it's one of the things that's interesting about this hypothesis is that all, it also shines a slightly different light on the origins of humans. If you talk to anthropologists, so they're always thinking about human evolution, they might think of the odd line or something like that as being important, but they tend to think of humans in isolation from the ecosystems that they lived in. What this kind of scenario here uh, represents is a sort of rethinking where we think of our origins as very much embedded in an ecological web in the savannas of Miocene Africa. We were just one of numerous animals there. We were getting eaten by things and bitten by things. We were eating things and biting things. And our evolution was shaped by our environment, but perhaps it adds a di different dimension to it when we think that we probably shaped the evolution of other animals as well. 
and the possibility that it's because our ancestors were horrible to snakes and used tools to bash them after getting up on their two legs that we have spitting cobras that live to this day. I think that really kind of shines a different light and makes us think a bit more about the role of our origins in the grand scheme of things. So the take home messages from all this uh, are really that, first of all, venoms are very much part of snakes interface with their environment, with other organisms. Their evolution is driven by interactions with other organisms, with their predators, as well as their prey. And if we want to understand venom evolution, we really need to understand how snakes use their venom and what actually happens in the wild. And we have huge knowledge gaps uh, in that, in what we know about the ecology of venom. Would you believe that, to my knowledge, there isn't a single paper out there that documents an encounter between a spitting cobra and a predator other than a dog or a human? Not one. So there are major knowledge gaps that we really need to address if we want to even start to understand the ecology of venom, the natural history of venom. That includes things like publishing interesting observations. Nowadays, with citizen scientists all over iNaturalists and Twitter and Facebook, that's becoming easier and we're seeing a lot of uh, observations, but we need more of that. And finally, many people are very excited about all the genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, venomics, and all the rest. But I think I really want to emphasize that if you want to understand what the data that we're getting actually mean, then we really need to understand the natural history of venom, how it's used and what it does. And with that, I thank all the people who've worked with us, particularly everybody on the uh, Spitting Cobra paper and the Lever Hume Trust for funding that. And thanks to you for uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for an absolutely fascinating talk. And we've got a, we've got several questions coming in, um, in in various various part ver, in, in the Q and A. Someone's asked about how many toxins roughly are there in in venoms, and are they widely classified? Uh, the number is quite variable. You, depends a little bit how you class how you, to what extent you call them toxins. So uh, you will certainly find sometimes well over 100 individual proteins in a snake venom. Uh, what they all do individually isn't clear. When you actually look at the major pathological uh, effects, primarily in humans, then you will find you're probably looking at a dozen or so major toxins that are responsible for much of the effect in humans. But some of these lesser toxins may play a role uh, for synergistic effects and things like that. So a lot of the less represented toxins, we're not that clear what they do. We know what the major ones are. You're probably looking at a dozen or slightly more in the or maybe a couple of dozen in the average venom. They then belong to a more restricted number of gene families. So these are all encoded, their proteins are encoded by the snake's genome. And you're looking at something of the order of 10 major toxin families, of which probably four or five are going to be important in any one snake. Um, I have a couple of things here from Ronald Jenner, who's one of my one of my colleagues, and he says, here, here, thanks for highlighting the important of natural history, the importance of natural history studies. And I couldn't agree more. I think Hi, the is <laughs> all about natural history. And I think it's really important to have that have that highlighted in this in this age of genomics. Um, Ronald also says, nice talk. Um, venomous snakes like rattlesnakes still try to bite in defense, right? If that's true, does this mean that it is enough of a deterrent to most predators that venom doesn't have to evolve to be painful? Or perhaps there's a constraint on venom composition that hinders the emergence of painful venom? That's like three questions in one. That's, I'm terribly sorry. That's a great question. Um, it's a fascinating one because, of course, we've got that, uh, you know, fox versus rabbit uh, select, the, the fox versus rabbit selection predator. Pre we would expect the prey to be under more selection for defense than the predator is for being efficient at predation simply because it's a life dinner principle. I meant to say, sorry, the life dinner principle is that the prey runs for its life, whereas the predator runs for its dinner. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be happening in snakes to any huge extent. Why that is, that's a really great question. There may be a constraint that the snakes actually need their venom capacity for, uh, for defense, uh, for, for foraging, sorry. Uh, we're trying to test that in a different system at the moment. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, Clearly, there are plenty of predators which do overcome the venomous defenses of snakes. Even spitting cobras are frequent prey to raptors, for instance. Uh, it's, it's a great question. We don't have a full answer to that. Hmm. 
There's a, a getting on to that um, that question of, of um, foraging as well. Is there any evidence that snakes will um, alter the amount of venom that they use dependent on the size of the prey? Yes, there is certainly for rattlesnakes, which are the ones where it's been tried on the most. Yes, there's good evidence that uh, rattlesnakes will inject less venom into a small prey item than into a large prey item. Yes, so they meter venom, they gauge how much they're going to need. It's an interesting one in the sense that physiological experiments that have tried to look at the cost of venom synthesis haven't really found a major effect. But snakes always act very parsimoniously with their venom. So the venom metering idea is why not bung in the whole lot? Well, snakes don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although yeah. one thing, a uh, myth I'll slay while I'm at it, is that there's also the myth, particularly in herpetoculture circles, that snakes inject less venom in a defensive bite than a foraging bite because they just want to frighten, not kill. Uh, that turns out to be uh, completely wrong. In fact, on average, snakes inject more venom in a defensive bite, but the amount is far more variable, which kind of fits in with what you would expect in a defensive situation where the snake is deeply stressed, scared, and uh, yeah, may inject a lot or very little, but on average, it's actually more. Well, interesting. Um, so there's a couple of questions here about, about spraying, about the spitting cobras. And um, one person asks, how high can the venom be sprayed and how accurate is it? And somebody else has, has suggested, um, asked you what your thoughts are on bipedalism as a response to getting your eyes further away from spitting venom. So the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. Okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting way of looking at it. In terms of, uh, in terms of height and distance, they could certainly spray a, they can certainly reach the face of a smallish human. Uh, I'm not sure that they could get six, uh, seven feet up, but they can certainly get four or five feet up. I've been sprayed happily while just bending over very slightly over a spitting cobra. I've had a face full, so uh, with goggles. So uh, they can certainly <laughs> reach that. That's not a problem. They can get horizontally to maybe two and a half, three meters. Uh, they, they, can have, they have a fair old range. Uh, depending on which particular group, African spitting cobras are really quite sophisticated marksmen and they wobble their heads while they're spitting and they actually modify the amplitude of the wobbling depending how far the target is away. And they seem to aim at faces rather than eyes and they, they're just a wobble so they cover a face. Well, that's interesting. Wow. So if you're far away, they have a little bit of head wobble because you don't need much to, to change the angle. If they're very close, then they will do a larger amplitude wobble to cover the face. So there's um, someone has actually um, reminded us that, um, that invertebrates in the UK are not covered by animal research or welfare legislation. They are included in welfare and transport law and wildlife conservation. So, so even though they're invertebrates, they're still, they're still worthy of ethical consideration. They are absolutely they are worthy of ethical consideration, but in terms of if legally acquired invertebrates can be used for, for experiments like what we were doing. Mm -hmm. That was checked very thoroughly. I think, I think, I think they, uh, that was understood. I think it was just a reminder to. to no, no, absolutely, no, no, absolutely. And I think clearly there are ethical concerns involving the use of any animal in any experiment. So um, somebody's asked if if you think that the variation in the experience of pain with V, and I've forgotten what V, what the genus V berus is due to random variation in venom composition, or could be regional based on the degree of human snake conflict in different areas. Uh, I suspect it won't be human snake conflict, but that it's due to, it's certainly it's due to, it, it's very likely due to venom variation. I can't believe all these people had the same thing injected in them for those different pain experiences. Uh, whether that's regional or not is something we don't have a handle on. We didn't ask about the origin. We're actually recapitulating that now there will be another questionnaire out asking specifically about experiences from adabites, where we're trying to track down exactly that to find out whether we can explain some of the variation. I know of one particular population which seems to cause a lot of painless bites, which happens to be on the island of Anglesey, just at my doorstep. And uh, well, maybe there's reduced selection on islands, who knows? Not maybe. That's something, that's something we're hoping to track down. Ah, interesting. So there's a couple of questions about where venom originated. One of which is, did, did, snake, did snakes acquire venom from lizards through, is snake venom, um, in common, is it is it is it synapomorphic with lizard venom, and are there any examples of snake venom genes arising from lateral gene transfer, from other organisms such as toxin encoding genes from bacteria, like like has been identified in centipedes? Uh, horizontal gene transfer, no, that's uh, no, that's never been suggested for snake venoms. 
Um, what was the other one? Sorry. About lizards. It's about oh, the, yeah, the, ah, the origin of snake venoms. I'm so glad you asked me that. Uh, that's, a, that's a major point of contention in the uh, reptile venom world at the moment. So one hypothesis suggests that glands that secrete toxin-like proteins evolved very relatively early on in lizard evolution in the so-called toxicophora, which includes monitors and heloderms, which are, of course, uh, very much venomous but also things like agamas, bearded dragons, chameleons, and so on. Uh, and that the common ancestor of those was in fact somehow venomous. Um, I think by and large, that's kind of fallen out of favor. And it seems that possibly something interesting happened with glands that produced more sophisticated proteinaceous secretions at that point. I don't think there's any basis for believing that the common ancestor of Toxicophila was functionally venomous in the sense of actually injecting venom into anything uh, as part of foraging or defensive strategy. I, I think there's very little evidence for that. There are just too many branches on that tree in between the common ancestor and the very clearly venomous taxa of today that where there's no evidence whatsoever of a venomous function to make that credible. Somebody's asked a question. Is there? Uh, there's a, there's so many questions. I'm not going to be able to get them all. So I apologize to people whose questions that I that I that I've missed. But we can we can send these to Wolfgang as a, as a kind of as a file afterwards. Um, somebody's asked if there's any evidence of the spitters using the spit to incapacitate potential prey before closing in on it. So um, no, no evidence of that. All the observations in captivity and elsewhere are always that they just bite their prey like any other cobra. Mm -hmm. um, and there's 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 a couple of there's a, a, a few questions there's a couple of questions there and they're all kind of similar um, is that is that is it is it true that sometimes when venomous snakes bite people they don't inject any venom yes it is true yes mm -hmm. as I mentioned it's uh, in in defensive bites what you get is huge variation in how much venom is injected. It's kind of what you would expect. If you imagine you're going out hunting, you're gonna take a gun that's appropriate to your intended prey. If you're going to shoot out uh, sparrows, you're gonna take a different gun than if you're gonna shoot elephants. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you imagine you're sort of camping in the jungle and suddenly something really big comes and grabs you, you're gonna fire whatever you've got in your hand at it. And one day that may be a fistful of pebbles, another day it may be an RPG launcher. That's what we see with snakes. If you're unlucky, then uh, you get the whole lot and uh, you have a really bad time. And if you're very lucky, then nothing happens and you should buy a lottery ticket. It's really, uh, it's really random. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've seen several people bitten by Ferdelands in Central America and it can be quite different. Um, oh, yes. So, so there's, there's a, there is a question here about whether snake venom can cure COVID-19. And I think we should be quite clear that COVID-19 is a virus and snake venom doesn't necessarily cure things. Uh, I think in any crude form, the answer is a straight no. I certainly wouldn't recommend trying it. Absolutely. Uh, whether there's a toxin somewhere that perhaps could have some kind of activity in vitro, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's always possible. Whether that could translate into a practical cure is a completely different uh, question yet again. Lots of things do interesting things in vitro, but once you try them in vivo, they turn out to be a lot less practical vaccines are a good idea. So, oh, yes. um, so, so somebody's asked, this is an interesting question, do snakes have any alteration to their native PLA2 pathway to counteract the action of their own venom? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, snakes normally have a high degree of resistance to their own venom. So if snakes in captivity, for instance, snakes of the same species bite each other, then that's rarely fatal, although it may, it's not total. So for instance, among vipers, if they bite each other, they often bite each other on the head if they're both going for the same prey item. And then basically one of the, the bitten snake will look with a, will have a head a bit like a boxing glove for a few days, and then they normally recover. So they clearly have a high level of resistance. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that happens with venom to stop venom getting up to mischief while it's stored in the gland is that a lot of the venom components are enzymes, phospholipases, metalloproteinases, uh, things like that and they are most active at physiological pH. Now in the venom glands, uh, they're stored with a high, then with a high um, 
concentration of citrate. And as a result of that, the pH in the venom gland is actually very low and deactivates most of those enzymes. Once they get injected, the, that citrate is of course diluted out of the way and the toxins are back at physiological pH and then they start getting up to mischief. Okay, there's a few questions here in the chat um, that um, someone has asked if spitting cobra venom, venom evolved as a defense to homonyms, and somebody else has asked is why couldn't it be baboons or something? Why is it homonyms? Um, why didn't homonyms co-evolve a tolerance to venoms? Isn't it equally possible that humans evolved tool use to defend against the ability of spitting snakes to harm them at a distance? Uh, interesting question. Um, probably not because tool use is just is probably too widespread and too diverse in terms of applications. I, I have difficulty seeing that. I mean, the, lots of monkeys use tools anyway. It's not just you, hominins that use tools. Hominins just took it a step further by being bipedal. We have our hands free to do, to do more. Uh, so lots of primates use tools for a wide variety of purposes, uh, not eating snakes is just one of them. I mean, we all, you know, we all know about chimpanzees using sticks to fish for termites and things like that. So that seems unlikely. Why didn't uh, primates evolve resistance? Good question. Um, if you look at mammals in general, what have mammals done about snakes? Some groups like marsupials, opossum in particular, and quite a few rodents, uh, and also mustelids have evolved venom resistance as an anti-venomous snake, snake strategy. There's a line of thought in anthropology, uh, propounded mostly by Lynn Isbell, uh, that suggests that primate evolution, the, the evolution of the primate visual system has actually been shaped partly by the presence of snakes. We're very good at recognizing snakes, even though we wouldn't always believe it when we fail to see one in the field. We're actually better than we should be at recognizing snakes. And the suggestion there is that the presence of venomous snakes may well have played a role in the evolution of the primate visual system. That's a hypothesis. It does correlate with histories of coexistence between different primate lineages and venomous snakes. So instead of uh, physiological resistance, we've evolved, uh, we've evolved better vision to avoid snakes. And it depends on how intense the selection pressure is. is the, mm -hmm. How intense was selection pressure by spitting cobra venom in the eye on uh, Miocene early hominins? Mm -hmm. I just, Probably not that so, huge compared to many other things. Yeah, so turning that kind of around is 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 um is um what now the questions have suddenly moved around and now I've lost the one I was gonna I was gonna ask. Or what any idea what might have driven the ring calls to evolve their spitting response? So as opposed to that's kind of turning that whole question the other round about about why spit. Well, cobras, I think one, one of the mysteries is spitting evolved three times independently in this one small clade of elapids. Why? And it's probably because they had several different pre-adaptations, if you like, that lent themselves to that. First of all, their defensive behaviors. Cobras rear up when they... Uh, when, they, uh, when, when they're confronted, when they're cornered, they rear up, uh, they do mock strikes, they bluff, they do mock strikes with open mouth, closed mouth, and all that sort of thing, that kind of behavior. If you then have a premature release of venom during a mock strike, say, that does connect with the target, that could already be selectively advantageous. Then they also already did have cytotoxins in the venom, which do cause some pain in the eye, even though not as much as that of full spitting cobras. So you've got a kind of constellation of different predisposing factors, which, at which point the sort of bluffing, mock striking, perhaps releasing venom too early behavior of cobras suddenly gave them a selective advantage. Mm -hmm. And which is why other species of snakes where, which don't do the kind of striking behavior, which hide the head or anything like that, spitting would never evolve in those. Well, that's I've got way more questions than we have time to answer. So I'm just going to ask one last one, which I which I've been wondering about as well, is how many times did snake venoms evolve? Did, did they evolve only once or many times? In the advanced snakes, certainly venom evolved once. Mm -hmm. That's at the base of the radiation of the advanced snakes. There's very good evidence for that from a variety of sources of evidence, including toxin gene trees, uh, the, develop the development of the maxillary bone, which is tied in with the glands that secrete the venom. So, for instance, in pythons, the, the maxillary bone evolves as one single unit. In the advanced snakes, you've got two different bits of development, the rear bit. Uh, develops together with the glands that secrete the venom, and it's what happens to the front bit that determines where the fangs then move, for instance. 
uh, all the innovation is homologous. There's a huge amount of comparative anatomy, embryological uh, and molecular evidence that venom evolved once in the advanced snakes. Well, that's nice and parsimonious. And I want to just thank you so much. And I apologize to all of those people who've, who, whose questions I haven't, I haven't got to. There are many of them. So you've obviously fascinated a huge audience of people with to hear that. <laughs> absolutely amazing. Although some of those videos were pretty graphic. Um, so thank you so much for coming and speaking to us tonight. And, and thanks to all of you who came to listen. And um, please do come back to the society again many times. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure.